Hey guys, I want to read this article on PreteristArchive.com from Scott Kessler in 2006. And since I've changed my views on the end times, futurism, you know, I've said the rapture isn't taught in the Bible, and the future millennial thousand year reign on earth isn't in the Bible and all that. So that kind of has a big impact on how to view, you know, the people of Israel and their future and whatnot and all that. And I've always rejected... Uh, replacement theology, and um, I still do, in a sense, but uh, I think that there's a lot of truth in this article, and I want to just read through it, and uh, the scripture that's used is not from um, the King James, but uh, the point's still the same, I guess, um, and I'm not saying that I'm considering myself a preterist exactly either, but... Uh, Anyways, I'll go ahead and read this. It's who are God's chosen people. Preterists are often accused to, of holding to replacement theology. The truth of the matter is that we do no such thing. Replacement theology is a misnomer. No one has been replaced in regard to the blessings of the covenant. The church is Israel, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, and always has been, even in the Old Testament. So I'm going to have to go back on some of the things that I've said about Israel in the past, some of the ways that I um, explained the scriptures because I had a misunderstanding, because I, be I believed, you know, the futurism stuff. And now that I see that that's clearly not right, uh, I'll have to re-go over things. And So I'll put together my own studies, but for now I'm just sharing the study, because um, like I said, I think I agree with a lot of it. So, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. This past week, I was treated to a wonderful slideshow presentation by a man who recently visited Israel. The pictures were beautiful. It must have been thrilling to see the sights and walk the paths that Jesus himself may have seen and walked. However, the speaker, obviously a premillennial dispensationalist, was obsessed with the Eastern Gate in his presentation, telling how Christ will once again pass through this gate and set up his millennial kingdom for Jerusalem, he said, is that holy city that God loves. They are his chosen people. The last slide was an encouragement for us as Christians to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalms 102 verse 6. Actually, the complete verse of Psalms 122, verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. This begs the question as to the identity of Jerusalem as well as God's chosen people. The New Testament gives us two Jerusalems, the earthly Jerusalem, the cursed fig tree in Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 21, which is in slavery with her children, Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, and the new heavenly Jerusalem, which is the free and the mother of all the saints, Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 10. Which Jerusalem can rightly be described as those who love God? The answer to that question has huge ramifications, both theologically and politically. I think that everyone is aware of the political ramifications of Christian Zionism, so I'll focus here on the theological issues. Should Christians bother to send missionaries to Israel? Believe it or not, many notable Christian leaders have discouraged believers from trying to convert Judaeus. John Hagee, the poster boy of Christian Zionism, says that trying to convert Jews is a waste of time. Everyone else, whether Buddhist or Baha'i, needs to believe in Jesus, he says, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced with Christianity. The Jewish people have a relationship to God through the law of God as given through Moses. I believe that every Gentile person can only come to God through the cross of Christ. I believe that every Jewish person who lives in the light of the Torah, which is the word of God, has a relationship with God and will come to redemption. And uh, this is where that is found, that quote from him, and I'm just not even going <laughs> to try to pronounce all that. So, showing who he believes to be sovereign, John Hagee writes, We support Israel because all other nations were created by an act of men, but Israel was created by an act of God. See, supporting Israel, 
John Hagee goes on to say that the royal land grant that was given to Abraham and his seed through Isaac and Jacob with an everlasting and unconditional uh, it was given to Abraham and his seed through Isaac and Jacob with an everlasting and unconditional covenant. He seems to forget that the scriptures plainly teach that by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. He seems to forget Jesus' own words concerning the real estate in the new covenant. The, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4, verses 19-24. through 24. Hagee also seems to forget that God's covenant with fleshly Israel was not unconditional. It required their obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 and 63. Hagee ignores the fact that Abrahamic covenant was already filled both physically in Joshua chapter 23, verse 14, and spiritually in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And I'm kind of curious, what does it say in Joshua 23, verse 14? Just to look it up for a second. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Joshua 23, 14. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which your Lord God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and none, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Hmm. All have come to pass unto you. That's pretty interesting. Anyways... More importantly, however, is the issue dealing with the identity of God and his new covenant. David Klinghoffer writes, Both Jews and Christians worship the same God, and both have a place for believers in God's scheme of things. Jews are the people of the covenant, while Christians approach God through Jesus. What is this covenant that Klinghoffer is speaking of? It certainly isn't the new covenant to which Jesus is the sole mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. It is foolishness to recognize Judaism as a religion of the covenant. There is no covenant without Christ. As even the Old Testament, saints all ate of that same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the and the rock was Christ. First Corinthians chapter ten verse three through four. So how has God kept his promises to his chosen people? I'm going to talk about the identity of Israel. The common dispensationalist cry is the Jews are God's chosen people. That begs the question, just what exactly is a Jew? Is it a nation, a race, or a religion? Are American Jews in covenant with God? What about European proselytes living in Israel? How about Hebrews who practice Buddhism? Dispensational Zionists have a difficult time answering that question consistently. Covenantalists, however, can take their definition of Israel straight from Scripture. God promised Abraham that he would make of him that he would make of him a great nation, Genesis chapter twelve, verse two, and that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. This nation was to be a holy nation. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. What does it mean to be a holy nation? Is a nation holy simply because the DNA of its citizens matches Abraham's? Which, by the way, would eliminate most of the people living in modern-day Israel. Does the term holy nation fit some goddess country or godless country that exists in the Middle East, founded by the United Nations in 1948. Hardly. God never saved anyone based on his or her genealogy in either the Old Testament or the New. If that were the case, then Esau, whom God hated, 
Malachi chapter 1 verse 3, Romans chapter 9 verse 13, and, and Ishmael would have a claim on God's covenant blessings. Uh, okay. So would King Saul, Judas Iscariot, and the modern day Palestinians, likewise Ruth a Moabite, Rahab a Canaanite, and Uriah a Hittite, the Hittite, two of which were Christ's ancestors, would never have experienced sanctification. Physical circumcision made one a part of God's visible church, but in the light of eternity profits nothing. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. A holy nation is set apart by God based on obedience to his covenant. In the Old Testament, a Hebrew who was disobedient was to be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Exodus chapter 12 verse 19. Does this mean that God changed the person's genetic code so that he was no longer a Hebrew? Of course not. It means that he was no longer part of the holy nation, God's visible church here on earth. The same is true in the New Testament. Example, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 12. Sadly, the, the ju judicial powers of the modern church are almost non-existent. In the same Exodus passage, God tells Moses, And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as native as a native to, of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native-born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 48 and 49. Again, God does not make this person's DNA match that of Abraham, but instead sets him apart as a native of the land in his holy nation. Thus, even in the Old Testament, God never considered anyone a Jew based on race alone. Both Jew and Gentiles were to have one law. This is even more obvious than... This is even more obvious in the New Testament. The Pharisees took pride in their language and their lineage, but were not members of God's holy nation. John the Baptist gave them this warning. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said unto them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say, to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew chapter seven, chapter 3 verse 7 through 10. The Judaists often or even bragged about, even bragged to Jesus about their heritage, proclaiming Abraham is our father, John chapter 8 verse 39. But Jesus was very clear with his response. Contrary to popular dispensational belief, Judaism is not Old Testament religion, but a demon-inspired Talmud, Talmudic cult. When the Pharisees rejected Christ, they rejected Moses. John chapter 5, verse 46. Therefore, contrary to the above claims of David Klinghoffer, Judaists and Christians do not worship the same God. The God of Judaism is the devil. John chapter 8, verse 44. The Christian God is the only true God, and the Christ of the covenant is the only mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. See August's blog, Only One Mediator. Those who reject Christ are neither Abraham's children nor God's. John chapter 8, verse 39 through 42. As Christ rejectors, they are no longer God's chosen people. Jesus told them, The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. This holy nation, or this nation is his holy nation, the church of Jesus Christ, the new Israel of God. And the Galatian church was so called, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. Paul, a Hebrew of Hebrews, Philippians 3, verse 5, was clear that it was those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. The church is God's Israel. Preterists are often accused of holding to replacement theology. The truth of the matter is that we do no such thing. Replacement theology is a misnomer. No one has been replaced in regard to the blessings of the covenant. The church is Israel, Galatians chapter 6 verse 16, and always has been, even in the Old Testament. No one can deny Paul's tender feelings towards his own countrymen. He is clearly dismayed over their stubbornness and even wishes that he could sacrifice his own soul for their conversion, Romans chapter 9 verse 3. But then Paul clearly contrasts God's Israel from Israel after the flesh. He writes, 
hearts. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, Romans chapter 9, verse 6, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and whose circumcision is that of the heart, Romans chapter 2, verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. In Christ, all ethnic, cultural, economic, and gener generational walls have been removed. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. If Jesus Christ removed these barriers, who are we to try and build them back up? While the modern dispensational church keeps its eyes glued to the Middle East awaiting some sort of theological extravaganza, Paul clarified that the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 22 verse 18, is being fulfilled through the church and the Galatian Gentile church at that, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed, Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. God's everlasting covenant is not concerned about a 10-mile strip of real estate in the Middle East. As Christians, we are members of the new heavenly Jerusalem, which is the one and only bride of Christ and the mother of us all. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22. So what should be the mindset of Christians toward Israel? Politically speaking, Israel is a strong ally of the United States and of Western society in general, therefore they have my support, as long as they aren't the aggressors of conflict. However, we must make it clear that theologically speaking, Judaism and Christianity have nothing in common. We need not attempt any ecumenical alliances with Judaeus. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. We are commanded by our Lord to make disciples of all nations, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, and that includes Judaizers who cannot be saved apart from Christ, no matter what John Hagee says. Therefore, while my dispensationalist friends are praying for the peace of Jerusalem, my prayer is different. I'm praying for the conversion of Jerusalem. So let me know what you guys think about that, and God bless.